Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. Today, the very first thing I want to do is make this a little bit about you, because it is. This is my opportunity to offer a heartfelt thank you for watching the channel. When I logged in today, I discovered that there are more than, a little more than 10,000 subscribers to this channel. 10,000 people, 10 times a thousand people. It's just an amazing number. Now in most things in YouTube, perhaps it's not a very big number, but I think in the astronomical community, it is. And so again, I just want to say thank you for joining me. And on this occasion, then, I'd like to make a very brief video that highlights a kind of a really quick trick or technique that I think everyone can benefit from. And I'd also like to take this opp opportunity to show you a little bit about what I am doing on my site, because I've been working so hard. Uh, for example, because of the comet, my goodness, I produced all kinds of videos about the comet. Uh, and, in, and some other things as well. I've really never taken the opportunity to just look at the website and give people a sense of what kind of information is found there. And one of the things today I'd like to show is the kind of thing that um, I publish on my website. So it's, it's a good um, look into what some of these things are. And again, just as a thank you, I'd like uh, an opportunity to show you one of these quick tricks. So going to my website, what's interesting is that I have a number of different you know, videos, of course, but there are two main collections of them. Because of the comet, people wanted to know, where are all the comet videos? Well, they are in the section that I call Horizons. So when you visit my site, if you just go to the, you know, the main homepage, this is what you would see if you were actually a member of the site. You see something a little different if you're not. And there are two uh, collections of videos as part of the Pix Insight series of tutorials. There's Fundamentals, which contains an awful lot of information. It has, for example, Fast Track Training, which is only a small part of a much larger collection of videos. There are 16 videos as part of Fast Track Training. That's just an introduction to Pix Insight for someone who is starting from absolutely zero and can very quickly get up to speed on what to do. Then there are lots and lots of videos, but one of the things I want to point out again because of the season is I've recently, uh, with the changes in workflow due to many new processes, um, I've created one that's for the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula right now is, of course, in the winter time, prominent and lots and lots of people are taking pictures of it. One of the things, however, about the Orion Nebula that I just want to add is that uh, many people, I think, are still under this thing that they feel like they need to take two different kinds of exposures, uh, different lengths of exposure, just in order to combine the data and to make images like you see on the left. But I claim that isn't true, not for most cameras and most equipment, not for most situations. You can just do one exposure time, and with the right series of processing steps, you can get what is effectively like an HDR version of the Orion Nebula, which not only contains the, the detail that everyone wants, but also the color. You'll notice on the right, it's a variation of what you typically see online, where because of the brightness, the brightness profile of the nebula, it becomes relatively featureless and or colorless near the center of the nebula. But in videos like I show on my site, I demonstrate exactly what steps you need to do, and how you can achieve this kind of result consistently, especially with a challenging object like the Orion Nebula. But, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, the comet has just been a huge thing over the past uh, couple of months now, so comets will do that, and uh, I am now better prepared to deal with a comet next time around, because this time around I worked really hard to try to figure out the latest and greatest methods of processing comet data. So in the horizon section, and that's where we are now, there are many, many more videos, lots and lots of videos, hours and hours of information. But I think that the most interesting part, or certainly the part that uh, is the most useful, would be the example processing sessions. These are full sessions. It's like you're sitting next to me as I process, and I don't I don't turn the camera away from anything. You see all the gory detail as I process images from the beginning to end. Um, the data is often included in many of these examples. And as you can see right at the top, they're all comet. 
but then there are many, many other beautiful objects that are within this collection. Even the data itself, much less the uh, recording of me doing it, is uh, somewhat significant. But uh, on the note of comet stuff, I've done comets now with one-shot color camera examples, an LRGB example, the example that I think is the best hybrid of both traditional and newer methods that remove stars like with Star Exterminator. The combination of Star Exterminator plus kind of like the traditional methods using comet alignment in PixInsight together can make for a fantastic way to accommodate just about every kind of comet type data, which I think is great. But I do also show, without using star removal, what the traditional methods are, and they work very well. It's just that with the removal of stars using these other um, tools and algorithms, sometimes they can minimize some of the residuals that you get when you try to deal with the rejection of stars in the normal way. So that's just a quick peek into what I've been working on on my site. Now let me show you an example of one of the things that came out of this processing of comet data. So here's an image that was presented to me by a member of my site. He wanted to get DBE to correct this image. Let me show you what it looks like unlinked here. You can see this is a picture of M101, but the sky is brighter than the galaxy itself, and there's a tremendous gradient in this image. More than that, though, the conditions under which he was imaging were extremely challenging. He was taking a picture with a bright moon in the sky, he had his own light pollution in the area, and he said that he was using t-shirts to generate his flat field images, which probably introduced an additional non-uniformity uh, to the correction, of, uh, to the quote-unquote correction of the image. So with all of this in hand, he had a very difficult time trying to remove all the problems. There were black spots everywhere. It just didn't look good. So I first demonstrated what I'm going to show you now is kind of the traditional way to approach working on an image like this. What we're going to do is go to DBE and set it up. The very first thing we want to do is set it up to remove the linear gradient. All of those things that I just mentioned are additive. The light pollution, the moon, and everything else. So if we just remove the linear component of the gradient, then we can see what remains. The complexity, those residual components of the gradient that remain, then you can do DBE again and try to flatten those out. Click on the image, let's change the tolerance to 10. Smoothing should be very smooth at 0.6. We're not operating on small scales here. Then we want to have a, you know, a good size sample. We want to do subtraction, replace the target image, and then click. Now, to characterize a linear gradient, we don't have to click too many times. Just put samples here around the frame. You can see how not careful I am being about doing it. Um, I'm just putting some in each quadrant like this. That's plenty. This will be able to do what's necessary to show us this linear gradient. I'll remove this. Let me show you the model. That is a linear gradient. And having removed it, if I now press the screen stretch again, you can see the extra complexity. This is the stuff that he tried to, in some way, get rid of, and he couldn't. It made it worse, really. But what you would do in this situation, traditionally, is you would do another round of DBE, where you have to purposefully click on both the dark regions and the bright regions with a very aggressive um, sample um, tolerance and uh, adjustment between the samples, a small value really, so that it will make these adjustments very near to every sample that you click. And that can try to make this more uniform. But let me show you now a trick that I think is much more powerful and easier to do. Let's go back to the original version here. And the first step is to remove the stars. We now have the ability, the power, to remove stars from the image. One of the things that I explain is why we're able to do it in this way. We're going to remove the stars by not using the screen process. This is what I explain, the kind of stuff that I spend time, you know, why are my videos so long? Because I talk about why you have this difference between screening and unscreening. This is the example where we have a linear image and we want to remove the stars, but be able to literally add them back to the image after we've done our job of removing the gradient. 
And this is going to be powerful for us because by removing the stars, then we can just fill the field with samples everywhere. That's much more difficult when you have these stars in your way. I'm going to go ahead and change the name of this to be stars. It'll be a simpler name for later on. So here we are, our starless image. Let's once again get out. Dynamic background extraction. Click on the image. Make our tolerance 10. This time we're going to be more aggressive with the smoothing factor, 0.2. I'll make a still nice sample size here. And um, we're going to want a lot of them. I'll just scatter them across the frame like this. Let's go ahead and uh, generate them. You can see just how many I want, right? We couldn't do that with the stars in place. We're going to subtract, as I mentioned. And here's another trick. This is the stuff that I explain in my website. We're going to use Normalize. If you didn't use Normalize, this addition wouldn't work. We need that background level to be approximately what it was in the beginning. This would be important for this particular trick. So we do normalize, I'm going to replace the target image, and then we're going to, um, oh, we need to remove some of these samples if they happen to coincide with, you know, an object or something like that. So I'm going to remove it from the galaxy like this. We probably, because the gradient is so severe right near the galaxy, because we're not correcting literally in the galaxy, it's not going to be a perfect correction here. Uh, but we can try to fix that as well. This, what I'm showing you, is someone's data. I'm going to argue not great quality data. People often critique me and they say, well, Adam, you're always using the best data. That's why your results are so good. No, that's not it. So here I'm using, you know, just data from someone randomly giving me stuff, demonstrating a technique that I think is very general. So here we are. I've removed some samples. I'm going to put back two because it looks very sparse. Um, and uh, uh, let's remove this one here. That's probably good enough. So we are now ready to see the result. I will go ahead and press the magic button and see what we get. Here's the result. Let's look at this. It's still relatively smooth, right? Remove that. I'm going to go ahead and close mm -hmm. this now. And you can see now it looks very uniform. But that's not, that's a little bit of a cheat, right? Because what I really need to do is anytime you do DBE and you make that adjustment, you're able to see once you do an automatic screen stretch, the image at a much, much higher contrast. And that always throws people uh, higher than it was originally. So if I now do this, you can see everything. You can really see even the electronic noise uh, within this person's detector. You can see all the banding here. That's very, very low level noise. So having done that final adjustment here, what we want to do is, of course, get our stars back. So again, to simplify this name, we're going to do this as M101. And then the final step is to go to Pixel Math, where we will take M101. I capitalized that. M. No, I didn't. Good. Uh, plus, and then we need uh, stars like that. If I do replace the target image, I can just put the stars right back into this image by doing this. And now I have an image that is virtually corrected everywhere in a way in which the original person, uh, the original attempt was no good. It was really, really poor. If we were to continue with this image, it'd be pretty simple. We would do spectro photometric color calibration. It looks like it figured out the balance with no difficulty. We need to link. Yes, link. So this is the linked result here. We can zoom in and probably display this in a way that we would very likely display this data somewhere there. Perhaps um, now's the time it's still in its linear state to do Blur Exterminator. Uh, let's see, something small, the stars are already small, something just a little bit here. There we go. Perhaps, because this is a one-shot color camera, that excess green, it just drives me crazy. So we'll kill that a little bit. And then finally, perhaps do a little color saturation.
and there we are, M101. Probably couldn't hurt to do a little noise exterminator as well. And there we go. Beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed this trick. This is something that you can use to your advantage uh, in your own image processing. It's the kind of um, novel approach that I look to whenever I do my videos on my site. And so as a thank you, I just want to show you these kinds of things uh, that you can take advantage of when you visit my channel and learn more about what I'm doing on my, uh, on my website. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for being 10,000 strong out there and clear skies.